Welcome to Don't Let the Delta Variant Pause Your Event Fundraising, Success Strategies for Right Now. This is an interactive exclusive workshop from Meistersoft, an Ariva company, and we are so pleased that you could join us today. I'm gonna to go ahead and get started just by letting you know a little bit about what's in store. We're gonna do some welcome and introductions. Uh, I will begin just by letting you know, my name is David Jost. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer uh, with Meistersoft, and I'll be enjoy, uh, enjoying the opportunity to introduce you to our expert panelists. Uh, we'll have a chance to hear from you because this is interactive. We're gonna really just sort of address the elephant in the room, you know, event fundraising and the Delta variant, misperceptions and realities, and ask some of your most uh, asked questions from the industry, as well as have you interject uh, whatever you'd like to know. We're going to be sharing some success strategies for right now, talk about what's working now, we're also gonna just give you a little bit of a technology overview about how you can really uh, address the, the kinds of things that you want to do. And then we'll be having questions and answers during today's session. So I'm gonna go ahead and begin with some introductions. And uh, on the screen to the left, virtually, you will see Jay Fisk. Jay is the co-president and chief auctioneer for Meistersoft and Ariva Company. And you know, moreover, he is an expert who is, has decades of experience. Sorry to date you, Jay, if it isn't, it isn't a giveaway for the camera, but uh, we are so pleased to have you join us today and share your expertise from over the years, as well as during these times that we've all been through together. So say hello, Jay. Hello, and thanks. Uh, thank you, David, for the opportunity, and thank all of you for joining us today. I hope that uh, the next hour will be beneficial for all of you. We've gone through some uh, rather interesting times over the last year and a half. Uh, we've all had to adapt, and hopefully uh, after today's session, you'll realize that uh, that uh, there are ways to actually do well uh, during a pandemic, or at least uh, or at least stay on track with your mission. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, very pleased to have you join us, Jay. And to the right uh, of Jay, at least on the on this slide, is Ken Cleve, who is the co-president and Chief Operating Officer with Meistersoft and Ariba Company. And again, Ken is uh, has years of experience and has uh, really been working directly with lots of our clients and the community as a whole during these times. So, uh, so welcome, Ken. Okay, hey, thank you, David. And uh, I'm fortunate enough to have been uh, working with uh, not-for-profits for nearly 20 years, uh, not nearly as long as Jay, uh, but fortunately enough, uh, I've had the opportunity to, to work with, with Jay and uh, lead the Meistersoft team here uh, to becoming the premier provider of, uh, of the services and solutions that we offer. So we want to teach you how to make money. Don't be nervous. Let's keep going. Terrific. And so, so now we've been introduced to our panel and I've introduced myself. Let's begin this session really by hearing from you though, because this is an interactive workshop. And what that means is you have a question box, you have a chat box, drop any comment, thought, question, objection, whatever it might be into, the, into those fields and we'll be sure to share them. I will also be serving as today's moderator and sort of pivoting from that role back and forth to contributing. Uh, but first off, I'm gonna ask you to kind of flex your uh, your participation muscles and to get a little bit of a warm up. I would like you to, in the chat box or the question box, whatever's most comfortable for you, tell us your burning question when it comes to events and fundraising given the Delta variant, uh, aside from that extra space after the end on that sentence. Uh, it let us know what it is that you really would like to know today or something that is just something that you wanna be able to address. If you walked away from it today, uh, this session, it would be well worth your time. So let us know that, drop it in, we'll be sure to share those as well. Uh, so let us know your burning question or the thing that you're trying to solve for. We're gonna be hopefully tackling lots of those, but we're going to be really looking at, um, at uh, covering the things that we're hearing most often and trying to uh, really evolve our conversation today to be able to work in your other questions as well. So as we're doing that, I do see some questions coming in. I'm gonna begin by letting us get to know who is with us today a little bit. And I'm gonna begin by just asking you, have you had any fundraising events since the pandemic began? And believe it or not, that's taking us back a year and a half. You know, have you had any events? And choose whichever question, whichever answer uh, fits best. It may be a little bit of an overlap, but letting us know, uh, I, I can tell you right now, the great news is, is that it's been jumping all over the place as we look at this. I'm gonna share this out with everyone. Uh, as we close it, but right now we're we're somewhere in the neighborhood of 42% who've held fundraising events virtually, people who've even held live events, uh, people who've held held a blend. 
I would say, you know, somewhere near 80% have done something, which is just great, great news. And so right now, if you could participate, we've got about 75% of you participated. We're, everyone is here. This is a, an open table. So please join the uh, conversation and let us know. Um, and uh, I'm going to bring up the results here, Jay and Ken, is if you want to just have some conversation on, on the uh, past year and a half and, and what folks have been through. It's been an interesting year and a half. You know, a year and a half ago, when we first entered the pandemic, I think that there was a perception uh, that this was a 60 to 90 day uh, deal and we'd get through it. Uh, you may recall that, you know, the whole thing was two weeks to flatten the curve. It was all about flattening the curve in two weeks. Uh, so many people assume that if they just sort of, you know, held tight, didn't do anything, uh, kicked the can down the road 90 days, all will be well. Here we are a year and a half later. Um, there's been all there's there there's been a lot of innovation over the last year and a half due to uh, due to the, the fact it's taken so long. So um, here we are. You guys see the results up on your screen uh, right now. Anything to anything to say to that, Ken or Jay? Yeah, I I think that uh, you know all of us in this in this uh, space. Uh, you know, working. Uh, you know, we're a vendor to charities, but we, you know, work closely. And the and the people on on the call are all with not for profits and charities. And we are nothing if not resourceful. Uh, so it's really, I'm I'm really excited to see that the vast majority of uh, of uh, organizations did do something in the last year and a half. And we're going to get into some details as to why that is incredibly important. Yeah, and that, and the last adjust. and the last bullet down there. No, we have not held any fundraising events. Twenty one percent. I don't know that that necessarily presumes that people used to do fundraising events and didn't do it for the last year and a half. It may be that we have people listening in that just have never done any fundraising events at all. They fall into the twenty one percent category. Perhaps now they're planning their first event. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think we're going to uh, take a look at the next poll, which is really just telling us a little bit about what you have planned, uh, you know, for the, for the let's say, the next six months. Uh, and I just need to be able to pull this up. So if you guys want to chat as I'm doing that, it actually is. Uh, here we go. Yeah, I think that'll be a good one to know. Yeah, okay, here we go. What best describes your fundraising event plans for the next six months? So. Uh, you should be seeing uh, the various choices that you have here. And again, they may overlap, but just answer which one best uh, fits your situation. You know, we have one or more virtual fundraising events planned or scheduled, uh, you know, either or. We have live fundraising events planned or scheduled. Uh, we have no plans for live or virtual events at this time. Or, you know, we'd like to do hybrid blended virtual and live events. And while they're doing that, uh, David, I'll just address that uh, this particular webinar we're doing today uh, is one we really want to make uh, bi-directional. You know, there have been a lot of webinars over the last year and a half by a lot of different folks, and they tend to be one way. You sit, you get a cup of coffee, you watch, they talk, you listen, you know, thank you very much for the information. We, we like to do things a little differently. We want to encourage you to use the question box and the chat box. Mm -hmm. We will pause during the uh, presentation today to answer specific questions. We feel that often the audience learns as much from the questions that are being asked by others and our response to that yeah. as they are to what answers we might have come in yeah. with uh, in, in our planning. So here's the answers, guys. I didn't get to do a drum roll, but just letting you know where it was at. It was as much as 50% uh, as we went in earlier, people who have yeah. live fundraising events planned or scheduled. And that's yeah. probably where some of the angst is right now, you know, and, and that brings people here. But this is a, across live, virtual, and, and hybrid. Any comments on, on what you're seeing here, guys? Yeah. I've, I'm excited to see that people are still um, yeah. making plans. That, Ab that's absolutely. very positive. Yeah, absolutely. that's great. So I'm gonna go ahead and hide that. And then we're going to, uh, you know, move back to our, uh, to our uh, presentation today, and I'm going to take us forward to kind of uh, what I call, and I just didn't put the visual up, but the elephant in the room, which is, okay, that's terrific. We have all these things planned, but there's this Delta variant or whatever's next or whatever's going on. And so Ken and Jay, to your point of bi-direction, I'm just going to give you a some of the things that came in for burning questions, 
and you can work those in where you'd like to. But you know, there were yeah. questions that ranged from, should we require proof of vaccination for in-person events? Uh, how do we find an auctioneer to do an online auction? How, to, how do we make the uh, event engaging for those attending virtually? Uh, and I am cut off here on what I'm seeing, but while, you know, while others uh, are still doing you know, things that compete. And uh, you know, I think uh, someone was saying, my manager says it looks bad on a nonprofit to be holding a 300 plus person fundraiser inside, yet it'll be cold outside when we try to do it. And I think guests will be uncomfortable and want to leave, not donate. And that's a, that's an important piece, uh, you know, to look at here, uh, you know, and then the the piece here. I'm sorry, I'm just gonna go back to the how do you make the event engaging for those attending virtually was while others are attending in person. So how do you make it good for all, right? That's an important piece. So yeah. we're going to start by it's interesting. You overlap, folks, with some of the most asked and unasked, and then you added a few, right? So this is this is what this is all about. But we're going to hit some of the, the things that are there, the elephant in the room in terms of what's on people's minds. So, you know, here's a challenge. Ken, Jay, why shouldn't I pause or cancel my fundraising event? Go. Well, because you're not going to pause, hopefully, your mission. That's the main reason. Uh, you know, if you, whatever reason you exist, uh, presumably will continue to exist regardless of a Delta variant or the next variant or the pandemic or anything else that comes along. Uh, you know, you, you're in, you have a, an organization that does great things in your community or, or your state or internationally. Uh, you can't put that mission on the shelf until times are better. So you just got to yeah. keep on going forward. You might have to, you might have to change how you do business, but not doing business uh, is, is not an option. Number two looks interesting here. What's that about? Uh, what what does this have to do with restaurants? Jay, you like to use that example. That's a good one. Well, I use that example because you know when when the pandemic hit and all the restaurants were shut down and people couldn't go out. You know, you couldn't even just go grab a grab a quick uh, sandwich anywhere because all the restaurants were closed. So the restaurants had to make a decision: Are we still in the restaurant business, or do we get into some other line of work? And those that decided that they wanted to stay in the restaurant business adapted. They said, well, if you can't come into my restaurant, then I'll set up a tent outside my restaurant. And if, uh, and if I can't get enough people to sit in the tent outside my ref restaurant, then I'll do, I'll do, uh, uh, t you know, take it, uh, take out. And those that I can't do takeout, I'll do home delivery. They basically said, I'm still in the restaurant business. I'm just serving my people differently. Yeah. And I think that's kind of how you have to look at your fundraising. You're still in your fundraising business. You are still have your mission. You just might have to do it a little bit differently. But not doing it uh, is is not an option. It should not yeah. be an option. I, I love the third point here. Wait and see is not a strategy. You're, you're, I'm going to give you a sneak peek. You're going to hear that a lot today. Yeah. Um, you know, it wasn't in March 2020, and and uh, it was interesting to see the poll results. Uh, if you had waited and uh, you decided to wait and see back in March and hadn't done anything, yeah. that's a year and a half plus under the bridge. Yeah. Well, wait and see is not a strategy, but it is a plan. It's a plan to fail mm. because yeah. because what happens is if you wait and see then you are allowing your success to be controlled by things that are outside of your control. And you want your success to be controlled by what you can control. Yeah. What you can do. Some of the questions you had there, for example, should we ask for the proof of vaccination for our event? That's really not, that's really not something that's up to us. That's something that you have to think about with, you know, how will your constituents react? You know, should we, would we upset people if we hold an event and, uh, and don't ask for, uh, proof of vaccination. Well, really, it's an opt-in, isn't it? People are deciding they want to attend the event or not attend the event. Those that are uncomfortable probably won't. Um, so, you know, th there are some things that are just relative to your organization. Your organization may be totally comfortable asking for vaccinations. Your organization may be the kind that would not be comfortable yeah. with that at all. That's a mm -hmm. that's a, a personal decision. But whether you, but if you once you decide to hold an event, once you decide to do a purely virtual event or a hybrid event or something like that. Those are things that you can control, and we can I, help you with those plans. You know, I would add to that, Jay. I, I love the analogies. I'm going to throw another one out. It's not unlike, you know, where there are mandatory, uh, manda where there are mandates and what have you, and you're in a, you're shopping, and you you know you, you need to wear a mask. That's the decision that's been made for whatever reasons wherever you are. 
uh, there's always that piece of, but there's still ways for you to shop with us. You can do, do so virtually. And so it's making that connection. Um, guys, I'm going to move ahead to the next one because we're just okay. kind of unpacking these rather rapidly. But what about donor fatigue? We all hear that, right? Yep. Are people still giving? Yep. You know, this relates th this relates a little bit to one of the questions we had, which was about how do you make your event engaging. Uh, you know, you can have a you, you can have an engaging in room event, and you can have an engaging uh, uh, virtual event, but the donors are the ones that you uh, that you're gathering because they like mm -hmm. your they they like your your mission and they like your presentation. Uh, you're in show business. You know, when you have an event, you're in show business. And you can have an engaging uh, virtual show business or you can have an engaging in-person show business. Mm -hmm. If you if you get those donors that have been supporting you and you show them a good time, uh, they're not going to be fatigued. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know what? It's it's a bit of a it, – saying it's a myth sounds a little harsh. We're here to serve and really just yeah. be pretty transparent. But yeah. it, at the very least, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You you look at folks who said, well, nobody's giving at the beginning of the pandemic, so they didn't right. ask. And lo and behold, nobody yeah. was giving, you know, and that, that happens yeah. all the time. Yeah. And it might also be the way you're asking as well. So I know that we're talking about events specifically. Uh, I do want to touch back really quickly because I have uh, there are some clients uh, the, the question specifically about should we require a vaccine card or proof of vaccine. I can tell you that um, uh, in my experience talking with with clients across the country, the ones that I have heard that have done so are involved in the healthcare space. Right. Mm -hmm. So those are the ones, uh, those are the only ones that I've heard of. And it doesn't mean that you should not. Uh, at, to Jay's point, it, it's all relative to, you know, to your surroundings and, and your local community. But there have been healthcare organizations that have required proof of vaccine. Uh, but I do want to talk to, um, to the point of if people aren't comfortable coming to an event, you give them an alternate way to donate. If yeah. they, you still want them to know that you right. still need their support. That's yeah. right. And yeah, that's absolutely. where one of our participants out there shared a, a great suggestion as well. You know what, survey your uh, your uh, constituents, find out what they think you should be doing when it comes to vaccine, vaccination cards, or enlist your team. I mean, you know, take a, have a broad conversation of what you think is best and what's gonna resonate with your, uh, with your you know, uh, organization and with your, um, your supporters, and also just what makes sense from a standpoint uh, health-wise. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna move us ahead and Jay, you were saying something as we do well, so. I was, I, was, I was just going to say that donor fatigue doesn't come from you asking. It comes from you not asking correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, a nonprofit hub uh, did a piece out there a long time ago. They said your your ask may just uh, may may just be crap. It may not be done well, right? And so that, I wouldn't say that, but you know, asking well is very key. And same thing with your events; they have to be done well. So what about virtual fatigue? Aren't we just yeah. Also over this. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, we we can't be. Uh, this is going to be part of our future. Right. And I think that um, the the generation, uh, you know, that uh, our, the vast majority of, of clients have an older generation as their supporters. But we're seeing more and more uh, younger folks, and I say younger between the ages of forty, you know, forty and fifty five, fifty five and sixty, uh, that are, are used to it. It work. We're doing this right now. Everyone's been doing this since before the pandemic. Yeah. Now it is absolutely commonplace to be on a Zoom. You know, I'm in the office 12 hours a day, and yeah. eight hours of that day is doing this. Um, right. But if it's boring, it's just boring. I don't care if I'm dressing mm -hmm. up in a tuxedo. My wife and I are going to a live event. If it's not exciting, we're still going to donate because we're there to support yeah. the organization. The same with virtual. If it's not exciting, yeah. it's just not exciting. And Jake, yeah, that's speak what, to that. and, and that's what I was saying before. You know, you are in show business. Before the pandemic, you were in show business, whether you liked it or not. If you put on an event, you wanted that event to to be special. You wanted people yeah. to remember your event. So you spent so much time on decorations and making sure the food was proper and the service was great. And you eliminated the check-in line. You eliminated the check-out line. You know, uh, the items were were exciting. You had entertainment. There were all those things you did to try and make your in-room event special because you wanted to stand out among your peers you want to stand out among all the other nonprofits who were competing yeah. for that for that donors for that donors mind share well once you go virtual that doesn't give you an excuse to no longer be in show business you still yeah. are 
You're just doing it virtually. You still have to put in a lot of elements in it. That means you have to change things up. You can't have one person talking for an hour and asking people to make donations. You've got to you know, weave in live and, and pre-recorded and, and, yeah. and special uh, special you know shout outs and all kinds of things to keep it uh, to keep it exciting. Otherwise, yeah. people are going to go into the kitchen and get a you know get a sandwich and yeah. another glass of wine and not watch your mission. Yeah, I think well, you're, to that point, real quickly, David, before you move us along here, to that point, I think it's important for those of us that are you know, trying to sell the concept to our executive director, or if you're the executive director or development yeah. director, trying to sell this concept to the board. I think it's important to note that our audience is broader. Before, we were constrained by the room, right? A year, right. A year and a half ago, we were constrained by the biggest ballroom we could find in town if we had enough supporters. But now, the audience is much broader. So it's not just right. the people who are the table captains putting 10 people to the table and you've got 100 tables. We're now entertaining people at home, or maybe right. some people at their office or while they're traveling. Yeah. So to Jay's point, uh, we, we have to be diverse in uh, in the quality and the type of engagement that we're that you are providing. Whether you're doing a hybrid, which is partial in room and the rest remote, or all virtual. Uh, That's right. I'm going to be the bo we'll, voice we'll of the, the, the ahead, audience David, sorry. out there, guys, as well. And just letting you know, uh, I'll chime in. Please keep these uh, comments coming. There's so many coming in. I'm trying to keep up with them. But someone remarked, the performing arts is another area where mask mandates are very, very common. Um, and I would just speak to that and say that Thank overall, you. another factor to think about is um, is think about your event because they're not all the same. You know, are are you are people separated naturally? Are you outside? Are you indoors? Look at all the factors and give it some careful consideration to make the best decision. Uh, that's something you're going to really need to spend some time with your team on. And one of the things you want to think about, uh, you know, as you're looking at this next question, which is how can I plan with so much uncertainty? I mean, how do I even go about this? Yeah, well, you you can only plan for what you can do. You can't plan for what other people can do. So don't build a plan based on wishing or, well, let's make our plan and hope that in six months we'll be able to implement it. Make a plan that you'll definitely be able to implement in six months, no matter what else is happening. And that might mean planning for hybrid and uh, and then you can pivot either way. Uh, if if you're planning for a hybrid event and you have to go fully uh, virtual, you can. If you have the ability to expand out into mostly an in-room event with some high, with some virtual, you can. But yeah. you can control that. You can. That's something you control. You're not at the mercy of of, of the way, which way the winds are blowing and what other variant might might uh, come down the path in 90 days. We're going to look at a lot of these uh, throughout our session today, too, so I'm going to keep us moving from communication to building in flexibility and, and look at this. But, you know, the piece I just love here is that, you know, people are looking for certainty. There, there is some certainty. It's, it's very certain that uncertainty and change are part of the new reality. I think we've all learned that lesson yeah. uh, very much so, right? So let's take a look I, at some of Go ahead. And I see a question here in the, in the chat box. <laughs> it says, I've heard the words virtual and hybrid used so much, I have no idea what either of them are. So oh, yeah. th what I'd like to do, if I can, is if you go to our webpage, and this is not an advertisement, but if you go to maestrosoft.com, we have a downloadable guide at the bottom of the page, and it's the uh, ultimate virtual auction guide. And within that, it contains definitions. So I just wanted to guide you over there. So it's maestrosoft.com, scroll down to the bottom yeah. of the page, and you can download the ultimate virtual auction guide. And Sorry, I'm so glad someone asked that. We have so many questions that come in so much vernacular, from, yeah. right, from pivot to hybrid and, and blended and what have you. But Jay, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you say in 10 seconds, I can help them. A, a virtual event is one where it's it's 100% attended by, uh, you know, remotely through technology of some kind, uh, some sort of broadcast. And a hybrid is one where you have some people in the room and some people that are that are that are remote. And it can be 10 people in the room. Or it can be 100 people in the room but you're catering to people that are within a room and you're also catering to people that are remote. That's the hybrid. Uh, if it's virtual, then there's nobody in the room except the people yeah. that are putting on the event. So we've got ourselves a segue, guys, to the next piece, which is one of the success strategies, plan for hybrid, flexibly adjust to the perfect blend. Mm -hmm. Share what this is all about with us, Jay and Ken. I was going to let Ken do that one. Oh, yeah. thanks. <laughs> I always sit back and wait. <laughs> and try to keep us on the on the tracks. Uh, so it's important for those for the 75 percent of people that said that they have done events um, and for those that have not. One thing we want to do is we want to make sure that we've picked a date 
we know we know we have to raise money. If you normally have an event on the 15th of October or the 15th of November or just before the holidays in December, commit to doing it. Commit to having the event. So planning for hybrid means that you have a physical location. If you're allowed to have people in the room, you're going to have people in the room. If you're underneath restrictions uh, within your within your uh, your general area, if it's uh, less than 100 or less than 50, can congregate. Plan on having 100 people in the room, but have the technology in place so that you can have more than what you'd normally be able to fit in your ballroom. So plan on having the ability for those that are remote to view view the event from from their home, you know, from their television or from their computer. Yeah. Also have the ability to bid uh, remotely yeah. along with people in the room. Yeah, so I'll start make a, with a hybrid mind. Go ahead, Jay. Yeah, and I'll, I'll make a comment. You'll notice that the picture on the left shows a couple of, uh, of banquet tables, but it also shows monitors on the wall. And, the, and that represents people that are in the room, but there's also people that are remotely tuned in watching that event. This is where having a a excellent an excellent professional benefit auctioneer with experience doing hybrid and virtual events is important to you. That's where... One of the questions you had earlier was, how do we find a, a, a good, uh, you know, good auctioneer to, to do the virtual? Well, you know, luckily we can provide those. But uh, the important thing is that that auctioneer, whoever's leading that event, has yeah. to cater to people that are, you know, right in front of them in the room, and has to also cater to people that are watching remotely. Uh, that is a talent that is that is not easily yeah. uh, adapted to. So. But that's how you plan. You plan for the yeah. hybrid. Now you can integrate other things into it. Uh, you you can integrate uh, uh, golf tournaments. You can do a golf tournament with a banquet afterwards. Right now, golf tournaments are very popular because they're outdoors and there's very few restrictions on on uh, on golf events. So that yeah. might be a way that you could uh, do something a little bit different. Do a golf tournament than do your banquet at night, and your banquet is just for the golfers, or mm -hmm. perhaps it's even for uh, with a virtual audience. So. The, the the point is that you have you have options. It isn't an all or nothing. And yeah. the worst thing you could do is just try and cookie cutter your in room event that you used to and say, well, we're gonna do the same thing we used to, but we're just gonna do it online. Yeah. Because that that's so that would not be the right direction. So guys, if I could summarize it, it really it's about trying to take that mix which could be ever changing, right? And yeah. so we I, I love that the questions are so on on point here. We had a question about that all sounds well and good, but we're going to lose our deposits. And that brings us to some of the kinds of things about, well, you know, what's your, what kind of game plan should you have for navigating this blending that we're talking about, right? Well, nowadays, any venue that's worth doing business with should give you the option of having a, a way out if you can't hold your event due to circumstances outside your control. Most have act of God, uh, you know, exits and that sort of thing in the contracts. Uh, if you're going to put a big deposit down on something in the spring, then somewhere in that agreement has to say, if, if the government doesn't allow us to put 200 people in the room, then we get our deposit back or we have some other contingency. That should just be an automatic. And yeah. even if it's not, I'll, I will share because I, I work in a, in a detailed level with a lot of clients across the country. I can tell you that even though it is not traditionally in the standard agreement, uh, for, for it's typically hotels, they will add it as a rider. You, if you yeah. request it, they will add it because they want yeah. to. They want to check the box as though they're booking the business for the future. Yeah. If you exactly ask, right. they will. They will absolutely add it as a rider. And if so they don't, walk it, next right? door. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So open communication is key. Um, I love this. Have virtual and digital scenarios. I would just add to the to the venue piece. I mean, if you're thinking about a blend. You, you could be looking at saying maybe you initially went in as thinking you're having 300 people in a room. And as you shift those mixing uh, levers, if you will, you may end up having 100 people in the room and you may need to alter and have more people, but you have the options to do both. Right. What is this, uh, this point uh, about putting the value to sponsors and donors in the journey all about? Well, one of the things that sponsors always uh, like to get is some visibility to your donors. That's why they become a sponsor. They part of it is is altruistic, and they want to help their you know the the charity, but they also want eyeballs on their message, on on their logo, on their their support for the for the community. One of the nice things about virtual and and uh, and blended with uh, with hybrid is that often the sponsors can get more visibility out of a virtual or hybrid event than they would get out of an in-room event. Because if you're doing if you're thinking of just a purely in-room event. 
that sponsor logo or that sponsor message is pretty much only seen by the people that are in the room. Mm -hmm. But if you are virtual or you're hybrid, that sponsor can start getting visibility to yeah. your donor support network weeks and even months in advance. And so it, sometimes it's easier to engage a sponsor with a virtual event than with an in-room event. And yeah, I can, I can share some experiential knowledge here uh, with some clients who have uh, uh, that I've spoken with that have said, that, well, we used to sell the back page of our, uh, you know, because we used to produce no, catalogs, no. right? I, I sold the back page of our catalog for, for $2,500. And I went back to the same, I went back to the same, uh, uh, sponsor this year and said that, uh, and this was a few months ago, uh, said that we're actually going to do everything virtual and you're going to be presented on our web page and it's going to be on you know the mobile devices uh, that people are bidding on and the cost is five thousand and they had zero problem doubling their sponsorship yeah. just by saying that they were going to be seed my born people. So the intent is that these are high, more often than not, our attendees and our constituents are higher net worth people or they're middle income and above, and they have the ability and the wherewithal to make a donation to you. That is the demographic that businesses want to be seen by. Yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so virtual is always evolving, you know, as we kind of move from the next point here and just, it's not the same. We've said that a couple of times, but you know, in what ways is it not the same? In which ways has it evolved and what's different? Ken, you want to tackle that? Yeah, I do. Um, real quickly, and then and then uh, you can you can sprinkle in the, the detailed knowledge. One of the things that we saw uh, a year ago. So you know we've been in this. We're gonna pretend it's been a year and a half. But he, so six months into it, we started seeing people attempt to replicate, as Jay mentioned a couple of times, replicate their traditional live auction online, and they would last a couple of hours. One thing that we've seen now is that they're shorter. People understand now. It's like. I know that the board chair wants to stand up and give the speech and get the flowers on the stage or get the ring on the stage like we used to do. And most people are not used to public speaking. So we know that when they get the microphone, they start rambling on a little bit. And the two minutes and 30 seconds that they had to talk turns into 15 minutes, then 20, then 25. And it pushes the whole program beyond. For situations like that, we're doing pre-recorded talks. Yeah. So the board right. chair who's doing the presentation or the executive director who's in presentation, we you pre-record whatever that you want them to say, and then you insert that into the into the uh, into the run of show. We right. don't give live microphones to people to do talks anymore, so that really cuts down on that. So Jay, more to uh, I'll hand that to you because you had a lot of experience. Well, the the other thing that is we're that. going with short just shorter events. It used to be that you know when you went to the local gala, it was a four hour thing. You know, doors open at five and, you know, and, and it went to at least nine or nine thirty, something along that side. Cocktail hour, five to six, six thirty, silent auction, closing seven o'clock, call to dinner, seven thirty, you know, eight o'clock. Uh, welcome. You start the live auction, nine thirty, you're done. Yeah. Uh, that th that doesn't work anymore virtually. So what we we're finding is there one hour programs or maybe even yeah. a, at the most an hour and a half program. And most of the program is pre recorded because you have the luxury of time. You know, you don't have to do everything live. Uh, you can pre-record, as, as Ken said, the welcome. You can pre-record the sponsor pitch. You can pre-record the mission, uh, the, the the mission video. Uh, I even like it. The only thing I like is I I tell clients to have the auction items, the live auction items, uh, have a little 30-second uh, uh, commercial for each of those live auction items done by the donor. Yeah, actually have the awesome. donor have the donor take take their 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 phone uh, and record a 30-second. This is what I'm donating. I'm going to go a ride on my boat, or I'm going to cook a gourmet meal. Here's the kitchen. I'm going to be cooking my meal, the meal, or here's a tour of my uh, cabin that I'm donating to the auction. And it makes it very personal, but it's also part of the entertainment. And because it's pre-recorded, you can control the timeline. Yeah. So you, it's not all live. So and then the whole thing runs in an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, something like that. Uh, and you and and this is the big one. In a traditional auction, you're you're taking each live auction item and starting from, time. from the open bid through the final sale of that in a two to three minute window. Well, if you have 10 items, that's 30 minutes, right? Three minutes per, but that's in a room. You can't do that virtually. You can't mm -hmm. give people only three minutes in the virtual world to bid. It takes too long to bid. Uh, you, and, and not everybody's paying 100% of the attention during the entire hour. So you have to start the bidding a day or two ahead of time. And then what you might do is just take the final bid during the program. Yeah. So, so there's things like that that are changing, and you can still sell 10 items live, but you're only taking final bids on 10 items live. You're not taking the entire bidding process on 10 items live. So it still does it still does work. Yeah. Uh, 
you also are finding that the audience can be much broader dispersed now. It used to be the only people that came to your event were people that were in the in town and could drive to the event, right? Or wanted to could drive to the event. Now, especially if you're like an alumni organization or something that has a, you know lots of of a, you know distributed support network, you might find people from other states attending your yeah. event, and that's new. Yeah, and it's that, a great that's way to engage virtual. people. That's one yeah. of the benefits of virtual. Yeah. I mean, there's so many awful things that happen during the pandemic, but this is one of the things that I think is going to continue on for many, many, many years, if not forever in our space, is yeah. the ability to do outreach to people who want to support you but are yeah. not in your geographic location. Right. Well, and even even preference, right? Some people just always come up with a reason not to attend live. And, you know, it's too much hassle. I don't want to dress up. I don't want to drive. I don't want to whatever, right? You have lots of reduced reasons for uh, for not attending. And so a lot of great stuff here we'll be uh, unpacking a little bit more. I'm going to just throw something out here as a question as I transition. Uh, what, what, if, uh, what are you suggesting if we're unable to do a hybrid uh, or live event since there's an extra cost to be able to do remote during the live venue event? If you're unable to ask that question again, because I'm not sure yeah, I followed the question. Well, I'll just take and field it a bit to tee it up. I think what they're asking about is just how do you really justify the cost? Well, you know, or in other words, will you raise enough money to be able to oh. justify? Doing this? Well, interestingly, yeah. interestingly, what we've been finding is that the the net that people have been making by going virtual from in room has actually been the same or gone up. Their gross is yeah. lower, but you know their their gross revenue goes down because. You know, you're not putting 300 people in the room and charging them $125 or $150 a ticket. You know, to to buy a meal, they're not they're getting they're getting into the event more or less for free because it's virtual. But you also don't have that expense. Yeah. You're not having to rent. You're not having to rent big screen. Uh, you know, displays. You're not having to rent sound systems. You're not having to do staging. You don't have to worry about centerpieces. You don't have to uh, buy. Uh, you know, you don't have to. You don't have to buy. Uh, you're not paying for valet. You're not. You're all not the, validating all parking. Stuff. All of those yeah. things that we didn't. We used to just. Well, they were throwaway expenses because we knew we had to do them right. because we had 500 people coming. You don't have those anymore. So you might right. think, oh, geez. Well, wait a minute. If you don't have the ability for people to bid who aren't in the room, I think that you're. I think you're losing more money than you could possibly spend on yeah. technology by not giving them the ability to donate. Well, you yeah, might also get technology that you are that you've invested in, and, and rather than doing it for one and done, you have the ability to keep doing uh, finding ways to be able to leverage sure. that. And so, you know, I'm going to step into moderator role here, Jay, sure. if you want to chime in. But I'm going to move us ahead to uh, to communication is key, and I'm just going to let you know uh, that you know this is a this is a very critical point. One of the things that you'll hear a lot when you're talking about times of crisis, change, and uncertainty, which I think applies to the world all the time now. Uh, you know, keep this in mind. At those times, the best advice ever given is that communication, not just communication, over communication is key. Mm -hmm. Let's speak right. to that. Well, yeah, I mean, if, if people aren't going to be uh, focused on coming to, quote, an in-room event, uh, they, you have to maintain their mind share. You've got to, you know, get them to, get them to reserve reserve the night you know if they're going to a gala they 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 know that it's on a specific day and they've got that when it's going to be virtual um they need to be continually reminded that means you you send out regular emails or uh you you know you you have it posted in your social media uh you you have to again gain mind share from them by not uh, having them think that you forgot about them that you have to continue to do that that's, that's and, and to that point with everybody Jay, else as like, well that's that yeah and that was the point i wanted to make is that even for the, there's a lot of people on this call that may not even have a yeah. date specific but they've always had a date right. or a season that they host their event even if you don't know what you're going to do i would i would go so far yeah. as emailing all of my constituents letting them know that hey we're thinking about you we know you're thinking about us we're not sure what we're going to do this fall but please know that we're going to do something and there's more to come yeah and and by the way one final thought on that in the past, you may have always had your event on a Saturday night because you've always had your event on a Saturday night. You may not even know why you've always had it on a Saturday night, but it's always been Saturday night. When you go virtual, it can be Thursday night. Right. It can be Wednesday. It can be Tuesday. You now have seven days to choose from. You used to have one or two days. You used to have, yeah. It had to be Friday or Saturday, but everybody else was doing their event on Friday or Saturday. Well, you know what? You can change it up, do it on a Thursday, do it on a Tuesday. It doesn't really matter because it's virtual. And that's that's one of the benefits that has come out of all of this is we're seeing just as much success on midweek 
Maybe we, yeah. Well, and if there's competition for venues, and that's the reason you weren't doing it on Saturday or yep. not able to right. do it on a certain Saturday, you can you, know, you can certainly uh, put out the most compelling event and make it happen. So and we're just going to sum this one up. With, I want to make another quick comment, David. I, I know that you want to move it along, but I gotta, I, I've got to say this. One of the advantages of doing a virtual event is that once the event is over, it goes into instant replay. Yeah. Once the event is over, it didn't disappear. It's mm -hmm. still there. It's recorded. It's on YouTube. You can continue to use it to promote your organization. You can continue to use it to do your raise the paddle, a virtual raise the paddle, send people up there a week later, uh, you know, go on, on social media, say, hey, we'll take a look at last week's event. They can go there and they can still make a donation. I, I know a couple of clients that make donations on their raise the paddle for weeks and weeks after yeah. their, their virtual event because people are previewing and reviewing the event from a week or two or three ago and they're making a donation even uh, even weeks later. So that's a that's a little bonus as well. Well, and to communication, I would say just summing that up, the, the point as well is is it's not just communication out to your uh, out to your venues and letting them know what you're doing. Let everyone involved with the organization know what you're doing and make sure they're with you every step of the way, regardless of the road ahead. So volunteers who would be involved with live, make sure they'll be there as things shift uh, for to your donors and your uh, supporters, make sure they'll be there for a virtual event and have hybrid alternatives to everything you're doing. Uh, as we move ahead to mastering, mastering your messaging, I'm just going to put this up here and let you know that it's just reminders of some of the, the key tenets of, of storytelling, mastering your ask, letting people know why you need to give and making sure that they know you're still here, you still need them. Uh, I don't know if there's anything to point to here, guys, but I'm going to make sure we get to all of our great content and just leave this up and 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 ask if you have anything you want to accentuate here. I would touch back on what I said just a minute ago. Even if you don't know what you're going to do yet, let your constituents know that you're still planning to do something. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I love the message everywhere. This is just reminds me of things because we're in this place where there's different levels of live, virtual, and, and what have you everywhere. And you may not be in the venue, or you may be in the venue. You have a place where you're always holding the venue, uh, where you're always holding the event, a venue, um, and you can't do it there completely or at all live. See if you can negotiate something to put up a banner that uh, allows them to text, uh, you know, the word give to 71760 or whatever you're using for your, you know, your text to fund solution because there's ways to be out there and have your messaging in lots of places and uh you know just do a little bit of everything yeah so further embracing digital and mobile technology and i say further because we've all become so much more digital jay i'd love you to take this one and just sort of walk us through how how one of the silver linings for pandemic is is massive digital transformation in a good way well yeah you know uh many Nonprofits uh, rely on I'll, I'll call it an older an older support network uh, that have been around a while. They've made their money, they're either retired or they're near retirement, uh, but now they have the free time to attend events and be supportive of their nonprofits. And there's and some of the nonprofits are concerned that if they go to a digital or mobile a mobile uh, type of uh, technology that that may be difficult for those that elder I'll call it the, the older support network to still support them. And uh, it, and that's really not true. Uh, in fact, uh, I would I would ask you all that are that are watching this right now think about if you have a grandparent or grandparents, how do they communicate with your children? They communicate with them by sending text messages back and forth. Yeah. Most grandparents these days are very adept uh, at their cell phone. It's their lifeline. They have it with them all the time. It's how they communicate with each other. It's how they communicate yeah. with their kids and their and their grandkids. And in fact, it's a safety issue them it's hard to find people these days that are up in years so to speak that are not uh, that are not carrying a cell phone with them uh, in many ways it, it, it is their lifeline so don't be afraid yeah. of moving I guess the point is don't be afraid of moving to a mobile technology for your bidding when you have to go uh, in, into the into the uh, virtual world you will find it it is embraced quite uh, quite readily by everybody at all ages and certainly and even ones. expected right I mean it's expected yeah. now I mean we've all become accustomed to that so where's the phone where's the app where's the virtual mm -hmm. version of this right so right. Uh, you know that's an important piece uh, you know here here it is you know wait and see is not a strategy again uh, you know make decisions and I love this one because there's a picture of a scissors and I, I something I've heard a long time ago I just would share is you know decisions comes from the Latin decisere which means to cut cut from right so to not sit in the place of indecision make a decision 
get behind it, uh, put your passion behind it, and continually evaluate and adjust. That's what we've been talking about. Uh, but what's this, this last point is kind of an interesting way to look at it. Uh, either of you want to take that? Well, if you, if you you want to take it, Ken, or you want me to? Sure. Well, I'll I'll start, and then you can yeah. you, you can you can play color commentator. If you <laughs> um, you are far better doing something because the people around you don't know what to do, you are going to uh, help to bring on their constituents to your cause. Uh, we've seen that happen uh, with with a lot of clients around the country who've uh, who've been in areas, uh, large metropolitan areas, where others in their in their town have not done an event, whether it's a, even if it's a peer-to-peer -peer or a team fundraising or a, a general mobile ask or, or anything like that, they've just stopped. What they've yeah. seen is that there's people in town that want to donate. They have mm -hmm. money to give. That's if right. they're not being asked, they're not going to give. Be the one that asks. Yeah, let me give you a visual on that. If you've ever been on a crowded freeway before, crowded highway before, it's moving very slowly, but all the cars are moving. So you say, there's too much traffic. I'm going to pull over to the side. I just don't want to deal with the traffic. So you pull off to the side. So there's less traffic. The cars are now moving faster, but you're not going anywhere. And all those cars that were moving faster now because there's less traffic are getting to their destination and you're not. Yeah. So in many ways, this is, this is how it is in fundraising. You have all these nonprofits looking or donors and engaging donors and things are changing. If you sit it out on the sideline, that's okay because there'll be another one there to pick up the slack, yeah. but you yeah. won't be getting where you need to be. So you gotta, you gotta keep it moving forward. Yeah, there's a lot of attention, uh, you know, that uh, you know, t that you want to be able to grab. So, you know, you you want to not just do one thing. I've kind of moved to this and do multiple things. I'm going to just stop yep. here for a moment and let you know we're going to be talking about those things. I will give a little bit of a heads up to folks who've asked. We will be recording today's session, however long this goes, and we've had some requests to keep the content coming. I'm going to keep it moving along. You will receive the whole recorded session, and you'll want to stick to the end. There's some great things hitting, uh, but we're going to move ahead here to what's working right now. And we're gonna talk about uh, from a perspective of the industry over the, you know, the, the time that we've uh, been all going through this and particularly of late, what are some of the things in general that are working well for nonprofits now? As I mentioned before, golf tournaments definitely are. I just came from one two days ago uh, in Tampa. Uh, they, they are working because they're outdoor events you can gather a lot of people, they can have some fun, uh, they, you can still do a, a banquet, that banquet if you're allowed in your state, in your particular uh, city or whatever, to have an indoor banquet, you can. But it, with a golf tournament, you can do an outdoor banquet quite nicely. If the weather's good enough to play golf, it's good enough to have a banquet outdoors. So those will work uh, really well. Um, there are other outdoor events like that, you know, walkathons, jogathons, uh, uh, sporting clay type events, uh, yeah. you know, in, anything, where you can gather a lot of people outdoors uh, without uh, worrying about social distancing, things like that, uh, are going to go really, really well. Shorter events, for sure. Uh, you know, the the I think the the four or five hour ordeal uh, has sort of uh, been replaced, at least for the yeah. for the near term. Yeah. Uh, people want to, you know, you know, uh, I mean, do do an event over a lunch, do an event over a breakfast. Uh, we've seen yeah. that we've seen that in different places because as we move into the fall, outdoor events are great if you live in a place where you can still do that as you move into October. Yeah. You know, a lot of people aren't. We, I'm in Seattle and it's raining. Um, yeah. yes, it so is. what we've seen here, at least in, you know, in our in our particular area in the Pacific Northwest and the northern states and like in the Cleveland area and, and places over in uh, by DC, is that they're doing VIP events with an extended audience. So they have 50 people in the room. Yeah. Um, it'll be a, a higher level event and by higher level, I just mean it's a higher ticket price and, yeah. and the food's a little bit better. Um, but they'll have a, a VIP party with uh, the bidding, uh, done in room and, and remote as well. Yeah, so, so what they do with, in situations like yeah. that, um, some people might say, well, okay, if I do that, then if I, it's a VIP event, there needs to be some sort of, uh, there needs to be a benefit for the people paying more and coming into the room. Mm -hmm. So you make some of the items exclusive to the people only in the room versus right. the entire general audience that's attending. I could yeah. go on that one for a long time, and I know we've got to get right. through the slides. So you were just uh, describing what they call bubbles of live, right? So having live and smaller component, components, having some launch parties, uh, 
you know, let's kind of run through these. We've got text-based donations. We're going to talk about these in a little bit more detail, peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, team fundraising, uh, anything digital and mobile. And, you know, share with us what's, what you see working, by the way. I, I didn't even mention that. I mean, I've seen a lot of things coming up, and we're kind of backlogging on some comments and questions that I'll work in. But I would just tell you one of the things that's kind of interesting that I've heard is that, hey, you know what's really great? Our event can't be rained out anymore. <laughs> so, you know, about hybrid, right? So that's a, that's a terrific right. thing. Everyone's uh, mortal fear, right? Uh, and by the way, you know, you, you can have a non-event event too. You can have, you can have a, a, an event that's really not an event. It's just a, it, it's a, uh, it, it's all, it's all mobile. I mean, you say yeah. we're going to run for the next uh, seven days. Everything is going to be by, by cell phone and you're going to promote it through social media. You're going to ask uh, through a peer to peer kind of a approach, ask all of your supporters to post the keyword uh, and the short code yeah. for the mobile bidding uh, up on their social media and try and get thousands and thousands of yep. people to uh, to know that you have a fundraiser. It's all by mobile phone. And you don't even have to put anybody in a room. You don't even have to necessarily have a camera anywhere on an auctioneer. It can just all be done right on their phone. Yep. So here's a here's an example of a blended live and virtual auction event in Gala. And I'm gonna turn it to you to describe, Jay, but first I just wanna let you know, here's a question that I think will be re very relevant. Someone just asked, what do you do about donors who like to be seen donating? And, you know, and generally they're at the event and everyone can see that they're doing this. And well, so you know, in, in the context of this, take it away. Ironic that you would ask that question at that point in time, because this event the last week uh, where I presided as the virtual auctioneer uh, had that exact situation. This is an event where a very high end event where the people that attend the event make a point of making sure that everybody else in the room knows what they're bidding. And uh, and if they're getting outbid by somebody, they make a point of saying, I'm now going to outbid you. It's very competitive. And so uh, they wanted me as the as the auctioneer to literally mention everybody's name that was bidding. And mm -hmm. with the text to bid system, we were able to do that. I was able to say, Bob Jones has got the bid of $2,500. But Bill Smith, he just jumped in. And Bob, you got to bid again. Oh, Bob just bid again. Take that, Jim. You know, so uh, we were literally mentioning the names, which is what the client yeah. encouraged me wants that some uh, some clients would prefer that the bidders be anonymous and that's fine but that if you have the technology that lets you do it either way to where you could either mention the names as the bids are literally flowing in or not mm -hmm. mention them you can do that and that's in this particular event that's what we did and we they were all virtual they were all watching uh, online they were bidding on uh, using their cell phone and the bid steps were flowing in front of me on a monitor with the people's names, it was just as if they were in the room, and I knew everybody in the room. And this this is an event that just happened with Methodist Health Foundation, Lebanon, uh, you know, yeah. locally, but it, it's still live. You can still look at this. The the video you can lives go on. Look at the instant replay. You can yeah. go to the instant replay and look at the instant replay. It's yeah. it, it's Fed, FedEx uh, FedEx Family House dot Meisterweb dot com, yeah. and you can go watch the instant replay. Yeah. And, and that's we'll one share of the that with all of you of afterwards. So so no need to jot that down real quick. Yeah, do that. But that, that is one of the advantages of doing virtual is that it isn't over when it's over. Yeah. You know, it, it can it can be persistent. So yeah, you don't have to rent the, you know, the, the ballroom kicks you out at 1030, right? Because they need to get all yeah. their staff home by 11. Not anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. You don't have to worry about that. So there was, so there was there bidding, lots of things you could do. Here are some of the other elements. Yep. And you see the sponsors on there, the Cigna and yeah. Deloitte and, and FedEx, getting their recognition, you know, getting their eyeballs. Every, no matter which screen you go to, uh, the the public that are the bidders are seeing yeah. the sponsors. And that's one of the things you can say to your sponsors is, look, we're not just going to put a banner up in our ballroom. We're going to put you in everybody's cell phone and they're going to be carrying you around, you know, for a week as, yeah. uh, as, as the bidding is going on allowed you to do all kinds of creative things with the with the bidding and i've seen you know we've seen nonprofits like dorchester paws a recent uh, example where they sold uh corsages to their virtual uh to their to their prom event i should say excuse me so they had a virtual element uh you right. know worked into that uh another thing that's working text to fund text-based uh campaigns uh sure. we mentioned that putting that on the sides of buildings putting it on you know having something that you can share if you get news coverage but also this is ronald mcdonald house charities of south florida who's who's really been doing this throughout the pandemic and they have text home to 71760, uh, you know, out d directly on their website. And it's something that's out there branded. It's something that allows people to give anywhere, anytime, because you always have your cell phone with you. You always have your mobile phone with you. And if, if you don't believe me, uh, just look to your right or your left hand right now. It's okay. probably, or your desk, it's very nearby. Uh, big, big piece here. How does, how does text, uh, 
you know, text to uh, fun text to bid work into that live event. Uh, those because I saw a little bit of that on the previous piece. Was that text to uh, fund? Was that something else? That was actually text to bid. That was the mobile yeah. bidding platform. Um, but the way that text to fund would work is that uh, once you have a captive audience, uh, you let them know that hey, we're going to keep we're going to keep your donations coming, or we'd like to continue to accept your donations all year round. And this is the way yeah. you can do it. So you get a keyword uh, and you know assigned to your organization, and then you publicize that. But you always mention that during the event, whether it's a hybrid, you have a few people in the room, and the rest of people are remote, or if it's a virtual, everybody's remote. You always mention that in everything you are doing, in every yeah. piece of mail, and everywhere on the website, right. especially when you're doing a presentation. Yeah, Rotary people clubs love that. People are more people are more likely to to text a keyword to a short code than to go to a website. If you advertise you a type website, in an address. You have to remember the website name. Then they have to go to the website. They have to find the donate button on the website. There's three, four, five steps to get there to make a donation. With a with a text based donation, it's it's instant. It's I've got the phone yeah. in my hand. Yeah. I could be sitting having lunch, and I can go ahead and I see the message, and I uh, just text yeah. text the donation and right away. It's a two step process rather than a five-step process to right. it. And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a donate now button on your yeah. web page. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lots of, we just want to give them, things. we want to remove yeah. barriers, remove yeah, as exactly. many barriers as possible between you and your constituents money because they want to give it, easy, it to make it easy. Anywhere, anytime. Yeah, absolutely. And, and hey, listen, I want to speak a little bit about, uh, about another strategy that, uh, that Jay kind of te teed up nicely saying, make, you know, it doesn't have to be an event per se, make an event out of something. And so team fundraising is something you all may have heard out heard about it's it's different than peer to peer fundraising in the sense that it leverages peer to peer fundraising it leverages your events it leverages digital giving uh, online donations but it creates a very exciting event that is fueled by the natural competitive spirit so we just recently in fact last week we shared a story of of North Platte Public Schools Foundation and how they just raised uh, far exceeded their goals by leveraging team captains and classrooms and teachers and all of the students to take a very traditional kind of uh, event, which is their change wars, the change jars in the classrooms, and they made it live on in that sense, but also to really take a life of its own digitally, extending the reach, and they were able to, uh, to really exceed in just a very short amount of time with an event that wasn't really an event happening someplace, although there were events happening around it. They also did an a live auction. They had a, you know, had a, a silent auction. They pulled together lots of pieces. They had even had a celebration out in the field to talk about this. So this is something to think about. If you have board members that can form teams, you have volunteers that form a team. You know, anyone that wants to do that, it's a key, key piece. I don't know if Jay and Ken want to talk about how that might fit into some of the things you were just sharing. No, I mean, it, people are competitive. Organizations are competitive. And so, you know, having the classes compete with each other is a natural. Uh, you know, booster clubs could certainly do that pretty easily. Yeah. Uh, there's any time where there's a, a a commonality of cause, but a diversity of organizations within that organization, you can, you yeah. can pull together the team fundraising concept. I've yeah. seen a lot of um, a lot of uh, or organizations that are on this uh, might have physical property, uh, not just an office, but they might have physical property that needs to be maintained, and they have work parties uh, from area organizations and companies that say, "Hey, we're going to organize a work party, and we're going to come out and pull all your weeds, or mend your fence, or yeah. help you paint." Those sorts of companies are the ones that you can take this concept to, yeah. and have accounting compete against technology and technology yeah. is competing against development and development is competing against management and management is you know having their team uh, their silo uh, compete against the rest of the company so it's a really interesting concept to take outside of your organization so don't it's not just about okay i'm going to have my board members do it or i'm going to have my staff do it take it to the companies that you already are your sponsors as an example but years ago you you had sponsors just like we've been talking about they sponsored events well, go to them and say, hey, we're using yeah. this team fundraising concept. Is this something you would be able to promote within your corporation? Well, Stop and your most passionate supporters, that's definitely getting them engaged. And, and similar with peer-to-peer -peer fundraising, you know, create a personal fundraiser, set things up, share it out. Both of, you know, both of these, they're, they're, uh, they're not different. They're related and, and one elevates the other. Team fundraising elevates your peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. And it really takes it to an even greater level. I mean, if, it, if it's exponential, whatever's beyond exponential is what team fundraising does. But it's all about expanding the people that you can reach, the people that can be engaged, and getting rid of that 
fatigue that we sort of alluded to earlier. Lots of people get really, really juiced about doing things from this sense. They get their competitive spirit really gets involved in, and also it addresses, you know, letting people see them support and learn more about their cause. So peer-to-peer -peer fundraising is a very, very key piece. This is the social cog and organization uh, in, in South Florida that just really is doing some great things and, and sharing out a lot of, about their messaging in lots of different ways. Uh, unlimited donation pages. I mean, do, again, we're all about multi-touch, doing lots of things, making sure that you have donation pages and that they can be shared and that whatever you're doing is interrelated. One of the key things is, and, I, and we talk about this, and I want to hear Ken and Jay's thoughts because it's, if you're going to be doing things, make sure that you really get the optimal uh, amount of giving out of that, that you get the best yield, right? So if you're doing donation pages, make sure you've enabled ways for people to cover the processing fee. And I know that that can be done in the virtual yeah. and is done with the MeisterSoft solutions as well. Let people sign up for a recurring gift. Let people, uh, there's this roundup feature that, that I saw, yeah. saw on one of the pieces. What's that about with yeah, the, uh, the auction software? There's three different there's three different things that we that we uh, encourage uh, to I'll, I'll call them revenue enhancers. You know you're going to get your donation, but that you want to enhance that donation. One way to enhance in a donation is to let the donor cover the cost of the credit card fees. Another way to let the donor uh, to uh, to enhance the donation is to ask be sure to ask that donor if they work for a company that has a matching gift. Uh, within the company because many many employees uh, work for companies where the where the uh, company will match their gift so that's a revenue enhancer and the third yeah. way is a roundup feature if they're going to have an auction and their bill is eight hundred and sixty three dollars you ask them if you're okay to round that up to uh, nine hundred dollars and most people will that's an extra cash donation so there's three separate revenue enhancers on a Perfect. single on a single uh, uh, donor uh, you know, effort. To, to lots and lots of things happening. You're, you've got lots of things you can move on and you don't have to do them all at once. You can, you can play around with them, see what works. You can get a different mix. One of the things I do need to emphasize here, and I think you guys would echo is, you know, your, your website's always been important and having it be donor centric and having it to tell your story. We talked about messaging. We talked about making it easy to give it, you know, given how much transformation has happened, if you have your most one of your most visible presence uh, points, you know, from a mobile and and from a desktop standpoint, how are you being seen and how are you sharing your story? Just two examples here uh, that run the gamut from the Pontifical Mission Societies of Boston, who did a complete redo of their website. They, it's it's powered by Ariva, but I mean, in looking at this, it gives people the ability to donate, to give in lots of different ways. It's mobily responsive. Social Cog did this as well. Uh, it's time to make sure that you're speaking to everyone in a consistent way and that your latest, greatest info and ways to contribute are part of the story that you have out there. And uh, I'm going to kind of pivot as I want to remind you, ask questions, because we're going to quickly shift to questions. So bear with me one moment as I walk through a little bit of an overview, because we've had some questions about our software and our services. Uh, does Mike, it says, does Microsoft, it's a different, it's Microsoft here, uh, both in Seattle here, but have have services, so I can speak to Microsoft, have services to assist nonprofits with virtual events, with the, with the technology, but also with helping us make this happen. Uh, speak to that as uh, in just a moment, guys, but keep that in mind. I'm gonna just share all of the things you can do and something that we're all about as Ariva and Microsoft is all in one, fully integrated, non-siloed solutions being able to get the most out of everything and bringing it all together. You shouldn't be doing things off on a tangent with a siloed solution. You want to be looking at ways to bring everything together so you can get continue to get benefits as you move forward. So Exceed Further is really the only all-in-one cloud-based digital fundraising donor relationship management solution as well as auction software. Uh, I'll, you, I'm not going to run through all of these, but everything you could possibly dream of doing from a front-facing standpoint and being out where the donors are, uh, to being able to really manage all of that in a uh, with a 360 degree view with households and campaign management and managing everything from pledges to donations and and you know it includes all of those things we talked about with team fundraising peer to peer fundraising online donation but everything's feeding into a single unified database no more trying to find the Excel spreadsheet that holds this the Manila folder that holds that. Uh, and it also includes hospitality management, which is a piece, big piece of what we do. I know we have a lot of 
healthcare hospitality houses out there right now who are very, very adamant about trying to use digital fundraising to fuel their very important missions like everyone out there. Uh, but there are solutions that we've been doing for that we've been providing for decades. Uh, everything is listed here. You're going to get this deck. I'm not going to run through it, uh, you know, over and over, but uh, okay. everything is mobile. I hear someone trying to interject. Ken or Jake, go ahead. Nope. Nope. Keep going. Okay. I was doing time okay, checks. Sorry. No, oh, that's all right. So exceed further, uh, you know, here's the here's the mobile piece. Everything's mobile, everything's responsive, everything is available to you in lots of ways, and everyone has their phone with them. So you may be compelled, you may see a message, you may want to do something at eight o'clock at night, you may want to do it while you're waiting for the kids to get done with their soccer match. You know, you 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 have the ability to do things anywhere, anytime. Not gonna dive deep, deep into that, but the same is true as I turn things over to Jay and Ken to talk a little bit about the MaestroSoft auction, a uh, wide assortment of solutions and services. Well, very simply, we, uh, we believe that the success of an event starts at the planning stage and ends uh, with the, with the post-event review. And we wanna be involved in that from start to finish. And so part of the, on the front end, it's the software and the consulting to uh, help you down the path. It's the implementation of the event uh, during the event whether it's mobile uh, or or virtual, if it includes uh, auctioneers, if it includes uh, uh, a technical director to run your your video presentation, we can do all that. And then post event, we we uh, will analyze how we did and get all prepared for the next. So it, it's it, it's end to end. You don't want to have to try and blend three or four different yeah. vendors together to put on an event. We try and help you do it uh, to where each piece fits perfectly with the next piece. And yeah, it's all and, mobile optimized. Everything we do is mobile optimized. And, and really the difference here is that that is, I mean, you know, uh, Microsoft from a standpoint of a lot of different kinds of things, siloed solutions people might look at, but there's really no one out there that helps you bring it all together from soup to, you know, from soup to nuts or all the way from the, you know, from zero to 60. And so depending on what you need, there's a lot of different options. Uh, we're going to provide all of you with a free consultation uh, or success strategies for right now, consultation and demo. And I'm going to put up a, a note as we ask you for your questions again, uh, just to make sure that you are, uh, you know, uh, aware this is not going to uh, to be a sales pitch. It, it's not. It's not the way we roll. We've been doing this for years. We have people come on with the simplest of questions. It might be a five-minute consultation. It might be listen to what we're doing. What kinds of things have you guys uh, handled on these consultations from a Microsoft perspective? <laughs> Every, it's a, I'll, Jay, I'll just, I'll interject with a, just a couple and then uh, and then you can, you can follow on yeah. with more of your color. Uh, things as simple as, can you be on the phone with me as I present this to my board? Yeah. Um, to, uh, to um, w which you're happy to. Um, but also people saying, you know what, it's our 25th anniversary. Uh, we're not really sure what we want to do. What are other people in the country doing when they're doing a, a, a big celebration given yeah. the given the pandemic and we can't get together in the room? Uh, so every, every, literally everything in between as well. And, Jay, I, and yeah. I, a lot of the questions I'll get are things like, well, how do I get items without cold calling? Sure. Uh, you know, how do I get the best items? You know, what's selling now? What's selling really, really well? Uh, or, you know, we've had a we've had a volunteer auctioneer for years and Craig, frankly, He's not only that he's not that good, but he's been doing it for so long and always volunteers his time to help us out. You know, how do we go? How do we transition from our volunteer so-so auctioneer to a professional auctioneer without hurting his feelings? You know, things like that. So we, you know, yeah. we, we there we get all kinds of questions, and we have we do have answers for for a lot of them. Uh, so don't be afraid to ask the ask away. Try to stump me. So, yeah. Here's a question. <laughs> Here's a question, Stop guys. The let me, up the maestro. <laughs> here's a question that applies because we're going to be asking for questions. Keep chiming in right now. I'm going to hit these in a second. But here's a question. So I have an event coming up at the end of November. It's supposed okay. to be live. We didn't make any contingency plans. What yeah. the, I'm just going to say, heck, do we do now? <laughs> so, sure. Uh, is, there, is crisis help available? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Let's talk about, let's, we would talk okay. about what have you done so far? And then what what is your what was your goal, and how can we take what you've done so far and still achieve that goal, knowing that we can we can only control the things that we can control. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, keep letting us. Know Whoever asked that question, make sure that you mark please contact me. 
yeah. so that we can, you know, outside of this call, we can learn more about your mission, what you guys typically do, yeah. and where you are right now, how many people are attending, how many people have confirmed, yeah. how many items you have, that sort of thing. And right. then uh, happy to share, uh, happy to share some answers with you. And I'm going to tell you that it's more than one that's asked a similar question. Yeah. So you're not yep. alone, yep. right? So we're going to. The we're great gonna... news is this. The great news is this. You've already planned something. So you are ahead of other people in your area. Right. That's yeah. great news. Be proud right. of yourself. And you have planned. You're going to have an event. And we'll help you make it work. Uh, even just by talking it through. So make sure you mark yes, please contact me. So here's some questions for committing to an event. Yep. Here's some questions directly. We'll just hit a couple of these for a couple of minutes. Again, I know some folks have left. Some people are still very engaged and everyone's going to get the benefit of this. But, you know, how do we, what's the difference between an auctioneer for an online auction uh, and a live, I guess they, they mean live auction in, or, or an in-room auction. Okay. Here oh, we go. sure. I, I'll answer this one, but then Jake can add the color because he's the professional. He's been doing it for over three decades. The The huge difference is this. A virtual auctioneer needs to be able to present to nobody else. They're talking to a camera. Yeah. A live auctioneer feeds off of the energy in the room. They may be good. They may not be good. But that's what they feed off is energy in the room. A professional benefit auctioneer who's used to doing virtual auctions can engage with the camera as though they are in the room with an audience. There is an enormous difference. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think you said it. I think you said it well. And the other element is that the professional benefit auctioneer, the virtual auctioneer, also needs to be well versed in the technology. Yeah. Because yeah. Uh, it's easy to get trapped. I mean, you, you've got an hour to keep momentum going, and you don't want to be fumbling around with now. Well, I don't know what this technology in front of me is doing. You've got to be intimately and in, uh, familiar and comfortable with it, and that's that is an important um, piece. I've got two more questions, unless one pops up and I change my mind, but I'm going to make sure I ask them here live, guys. Yeah. yeah. By the way, we're going to address all your questions. So we're going to reach back and, you know, if you have a question, we'll share that out. And we're sharing the recording. We're sharing a link to the uh, to the uh, uh, FedEx uh, House op uh, auction event, uh, et cetera, from uh, Methodist Health Foundation. Uh, we're going to be sharing all of that. But the first question here, I absolutely love this one. How are you using virtual and hybrid events to attract more donors who are people of color and just to create greater diversity of your audience. Wow. Absolutely. The uh, utilizing your constituent database. Mm -hmm. So if um, the nice part about uh, virtual is that uh, they don't have to, wh whoever your attendees are, don't have to make the effort to come in room. Mm -hmm. They can participate from wherever they are. And that opens up to yeah. everybody. Well, Every across all sectors, right? So I would just tell yeah. you accessibility. Accessibility is a big, big plus of virtual. Yeah. So you have people that just are homebound, people that are not able to come, people who maybe aren't able to come up with the, the money to participate at the level of, of being at the event, but now can enjoy a, a, you know, some semblance of that in, in lots of different ways. So that, that's a terrific one. Anything to add, Jay? Only that that I think that that's an opportunity for what to for people to host watch parties. Yeah, have hosts uh, that are saying, you know what, I can and I'll invite ten or twenty people over to my house to watch the event. And if you get ten or twenty people each willing to do a watch party and invite people over to their house, you now can have that audience, that diverse audience that you're looking for, and they're watching it in in effect at ten to twenty different locations, but they're all watching yeah. the same. Yeah. the same program together yep. and if you're using if you're if you're doing it a professional way you can cut in and out as part of your run of show you can yeah. cut out yeah. to hey the watch party you know in philadelphia and oh let's yeah. cut to the watch party in tampa and you know yeah it's everyone has a seat at the doable. table yeah absolutely. absolutely so that's great so here's a here's another question and this one's very very particular but i think it's a good example and i'd love to see you guys go to work on it if you're doing a casino night with auction, do you have any ideas about incorporating hybrid or is it best just to reschedule that COVID is still a problem in our area? And and that's everywhere, right? So uh, what about that question? Well, Jay may have some additional color, but I would say this, if you are considering going virtual or hybrid with your casino night, be aware of your state and local raffle laws. That's for sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, I know I didn't give you any good information there. How about you, Jay? What do you think about that? I mean, no, is it I, safe to postpone it? Because I mean, I, I hate to have all those people already willing to attend. Maybe this is one of those. Maybe this is this, one of those situations where you require a vaccine card. I, I think this attend. is. A, I think this is one of those where you contact us. We need. I yeah. think I need, okay. I need more yeah, information. Yeah, let's get around. You need more info. Yeah, yeah. We definitely want to be very responsible about that. But yeah. you know, I would, I would venture to say that, like, I've seen this, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. But there's a way to be able to. to I'm going to say the one. Uh, I don't believe I've used it once. So I'm going to use up my pivot card by saying there's a way for you to pivot from just about anything to something that's going to be as good as or better. True or false? You know. True. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It was a loaded question, right? Because I know the answer. Yeah. But yeah. No, this is great. If you have questions, burning or otherwise, just go ahead and drop them in here. And by the way, uh, we are going to now we're going to kind of come to a close here. I've left yeah. the, the poll open. If you didn't get a chance to answer uh, that piece, please go ahead and drop a note in the comment or question box, excuse me. And we're going to go ahead and just uh, do our kind of our close uh, around the, the circle just to have everyone. Uh, kind of say their final words, uh, any sort of, uh, you know, thank yous. And I'm going to begin, and as we're doing this, I'm just going to go back to some of the tile slides that share the solutions because we've had some requests for that. But this has been brought to you by Areva and Meistersoft and Areva Company. We're glad to have you here. I'm going to just give my thank you right now to Jay and Ken for the investment of your time, but I'm going to give a huge thank you to those of you who participated, and I mean participated. Lots of great stuff here. That's what this uh, nonprofit uh, community is all about. So I'm going to turn it first uh, to uh, to Ken to give us his uh, his final words and his uh, his thank yous. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, I've seen some of the questions, and uh, some of you I've spoken with this week, so I'm, I'm glad that you're here. And uh, one of the things that you should take away from this is that do not be afraid to ask. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I appreciate that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Jay really kind of close us out uh, with uh, his final words and uh, any thank yous. Just going to say, uh, first of all, thank all of you for attending and thank you for your questions. Those questions we were able to answer and those questions that we will answer and get out to all of you because all those questions that you've given us today will benefit everybody that, that's going to get this recording. Uh, but there's an old saying, you know, we're all in the same boat. In this case, we're not in the same boat. We're in the same ocean. We yeah. each have our own boat. And how you make that boat float and how you make that boat get to port during rough seas really is up to you. You're the captain of that boat. Uh, so there will be boats that will get to that to get to that port. Make sure yours is one of them. Well, we we are so grateful. Thank you guys, and we're so grateful for everyone who's here. We look forward to talking with you. Uh, make sure that uh, you reach out to us. Uh, dot com, and there's tons and tons of information there. And stay tuned. We're, we have more uh, great information coming your way. And I'm just gonna let you know, if you do wanna consult with us, we've had a number of questions about Giving Tuesday, about end of year, uh, and those are events, whether you call them that or not, that is an event that we can help you. So just Absolutely. let that be the corner of what you wanna talk about. Thank you, everyone stay safe, stay healthy, and, uh, and you know, and get moving, make some decisions, and don't wait and see. Bye everybody. Have a wonderful week, bye. Yep. Thanks.